rights in the laws of nature and can find them only in the laws of political society. I have looked for our rights in the constitution of the English government and found them there. Our rights have been violated, Mr. Adams. That is beyond dispute. This is Plausibly Live. When pressed as to why there was no Bill of Rights contained in the original proposed Constitution, James Madison came up with an explanation. It sounds weird. I mean, it really does. It's a strange explanation. And it's one that I privately wonder if it actually... Number one, it doesn't hold any water. But I'm wondering sometimes, did he believe it? Did he actually believe that the Constitution of the United States didn't need a Bill of Rights? Which is what he said. It doesn't need it because if you put a Bill of Rights into the proposed Constitution, you will confuse people. You will cause people to believe that that Bill of Rights is the limit of their rights that they don't have any more rights, that they don't have anything beyond what's in this Bill of Rights, and that no other rights, therefore, will exist. And so, by not putting a Bill of Rights in there, he sort of created his idea that if it doesn't say that you can do something in the Constitution, then you can't. Which would be a great idea if that's what actually happened, but didn't as we all know it's this lack of a bill of rights in the in the proposed constitution that actually becomes the singular issue all the other stuff the courts the presidency uh, is it a really a republic is it really this all of that other stuff isn't just secondary it's not even in the same ballpark as the argument as to why there is no bill of rights in the constitution and it's this single issue which almost derails the ratification of the Constitution of the United States. And in fact, it isn't until they agree to put one in that ratification can move forward. And no one is more vocal about this, at least in writing anyway, than our anti-federalist that we're looking at these days, Brutus. Brutus begins his second letter to the people of New York with this basic premise. If we may collect the sentiments of the people of America from their most solemn declarations, they hold this truth as self-evident, that all men are by nature free. No man, therefore, or any class of men have a right by the law of nature or of God to assume or exercise authority over their fellows. When you go back in history and ask yourself, why do we form governments? Why do we form societies? It's it's an interesting sociological study, anthropologic study, um, and it makes you look at things a little bit different sometimes. In the natural state, Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. This is the way of things. I mean, it really is. The the idea here that Brutus actually outlines is that when there is no government, when in the natural state of man, the strong dominate the weak, the, the devious plot against the not-so-smart and take their stuff, and every man does what's right in his own eyes. This is actually an idea that we get um, in the the book, (laughs) the Torah, we're told it's not supposed to be that way. When God is giving the Torah at Sinai, he actually reminds the people that when they get to the Holy Land, when they get to the Promised Land, Things are not to be this way. They are not to be every man doing as he did in Egypt what was right in his own eyes. You're going to establish a government that will protect the entirety of the community. And that's why we do it. 
Brutus outlines this. The reason we voluntarily give up some of our liberty is for the protection of all of our liberties. And it's very limited. And in doing so, we establish this government to protect the entire community. And when those protections, which are very well delineated, are ignored by rulers, problems happen. When those protections are discarded, as we will see in the book of Judges later on, uh, every man will do what is right in his own eyes. And that's where you begin to have problems. All societies, regardless of what they are, need that foundation. They need that that establishment of these are our rules. And for the people that are in charge, we will give you some of our liberty, but only because we want all of our liberty protected. And when you don't have that foundation, Brutus says, well, without a good foundation, buildings will fall down. The problem that they have is that you're going to have to have a ruler. It's interesting to me that Brutus refers to them, to the the proposed Congress and president and judges as rulers. There's, I think, a certain, he's trying to make a point, but I wonder if he was looking into his crystal ball and seeing into the future where we don't so much have leaders anymore as we have rulers. But he makes this observation about rulers. Rulers have the same propensities as other men. They are as likely to use the power with which they are vested for private purposes and to the injury and oppression of those over whom they are placed, as individuals in a state of nature are to injure and oppress one another. They're just as likely. It is therefore proper that bounds should be set to their authority, as the government should have at first been instituted to restrain private injury. It's kind of a wordy 7th, 18th century way of saying you put limits on government to protect the society as a whole. But the problem is that these rulers, as he talks about, need to be limited. They need to have rules that they have to follow, that they cannot break. And if they do break them, well, in Rome, they used to kill you. We're not probably going to do that here, but We certainly need to understand that the people are sovereign, not the ruler. And in order to protect all of our liberties, if we allow them to use the power that they're given to enrich themselves and to harm other people, then they're not really leaders. They are rulers, in fact, and we have forgotten that. He wants limits on this. And of course, the limits are found in bills of rights. His argument is that the states. Almost all of the state constitutions have these Bill of Rights. Virginia certainly has it, and Madison is very aware of the fact that Virginia has a Declaration of Rights. The proposed Constitution, he points out, has some rights, particularly in Article 1, Section 9. It has a few of these rights, but not all of them, and certainly no Bill of Rights in, in the problem. In in the proposed constitution, sorry, not the problem, the proposed constitution, because it doesn't have these, it raises eyebrows, it raises questions. Why are these not here? Look, the states understand that they have to have limits on the state governments in these bills of rights. You're telling me that your proposed federal government doesn't need those? That you can only have, I don't know, three or four rights as outlined and delineated in Article 1, Section 9? What about the rest of them? And this is where Madison's argument comes into play, which is that, look, if we start writing down bills of rights for the federal government, then you will assume that that's all you have, he says, which is a ridiculous argument. I don't know anybody that would think that way. But of course, it does lead to the Madisonian interpretive idea which is that if the Constitution Constitution doesn't say you can do it, you cannot. Brutus is really, and, and his second letter is really all about this question. Why is there no Bill of Rights? Bill of Rights place limits on rulers, and he continues to, ru- to refer to the proposed Congress, the proposed presidency, the proposed courts. He pr- continues to refer to them as rulers. 
that have the propensity to be as likely to use the power they are vested with for private purposes. He, he makes it clear that he is not convinced, and he doesn't see anything in this proposed Constitution that limits those powers, that limits the ability of rulers to overstep the liberties of the people. And because of this, he is convinced that unless you have a Bill of Rights, this is just a recipe for, it's, it's just a recipe for disaster. It really is. He goes further in this, and this is a little wordy. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. He talks about that principle, the principle that rulers will always use their power for private purposes and harm. It seems so evidently founded in the reason and nature of things. It's confirmed by universal experience, he says. Those who have governed have been found in all ages ever active to enlarge their powers and abridge the public liberty. This has induced people in all countries where any sense of freedom remained to fix barriers against the encroachment of their rulers. He talks about the fact that the country we came from, England, has the Magna Carta and a Bill of Rights, and that they've long boasted about those. It cert from this it appears that at a time when the pulse of liberty beat high, and when an appeal was made to the people to form constitutions for the government and themselves, it was their universal sense that such declarations should be made part of the frames of government. It is therefore more astonishing that the, this grand security to the rights of the people is not to be found in this Constitution. He makes the point that all of history, certainly all of free history, from the Greek states to the Roman Republic, to the English monarchy, to the, to the whole thing, every time liberty is at stake, the people limit the government. And they always proudly proclaim that. They always make a, a point of putting that up on the wall and engraving it and making monuments to it. And you're telling me that your constitution, which says right in its preamble to preserve liberty, blessings of liberty to ourselves and all other seceding generations, you're telling me that this great effort that you sat at these tables and wrote to guarantee American liberty from now to all generations to come doesn't have a Bill of Rights, doesn't have the very thing that every single government ever established that guarantees freedom has? <laughs> Calling BS, he kind of says. Madison's argument is so strange to me. I find myself wondering, 250 some odd years later, I wonder if he really believed it. I really do. I don't obviously know Madison. I never got to talk to him. But I wonder sometimes if, I wonder sometimes if he got caught in this, caught up in this idea that well, there must be a reason we didn't do this. And the reason we didn't do this is because we're trying to benefit you. You're not seeing the logic of what we're doing here. You're not seeing the, the intelligence with which we didn't put in a Bill of Rights because we wanted you to have more rights. It's a great excuse. Sometimes I wonder if Madison, who would go on to write 10 of the first 13 amendments proposed, now known as our Bill of Rights, actually believed it. I don't know that he did. I think he, I think he might have gotten caught up in ego. Look, he's the father of the Constitution. He, he might have gotten caught up in this idea that, well, I didn't put it in there. I didn't insist on it being put in there. There must be a reason why I didn't. And so here's my reason. And of course, ultimately, his logic, his Madisonian interpretation, if it doesn't say you can do it, you can't, would be utterly subsumed by the Hamiltonian interpretation, which is if it doesn't say you can't do it, you can. not Which, of course, is exactly what Brutus was saying when he said rulers have the same propensity, they're as likely to use the power they are vested with 
for private purposes and injury and oppression of those over whom they are placed in charge. Hmm. Looking forward from 1787, who was right, Brutus or Madison? At the end of the day, Brutus comes to a conclusion in his second letter, which is simply this. I cannot help suspecting that the persons who attempt to persuade people that such reservations were less necessary under this Constitution than under those of the states, it's Madison's argument, are willfully endeavoring to deceive and to lead you into an absolute state of vassalage. That is, they are tricking you into believing that you don't need a Bill of Rights. Gosh, if, if you have a Bill of Rights, you'll just think that that's all you've got, and, you know, bingo. But then when it's not there, then the rules change, don't they? Well, it doesn't say we can't. Brutus just destroys Madison's argument there. But of all the anti-federalist positions that we have, of all the anti-federalist positions that there will be, it's this lack of a Bill of Rights that will most resonate around the country. Even people who are leaning federalist or completely federalist recognize that this lack of a Bill of Rights, th this is a problem. We, we, we have to fix that. Because without this Bill of Rights, well, Brutus is right. The Anti-Federalist position is right. If we don't put limits on this government, Congress shall make no law. If we don't limit them, they will, because this is the natural state of mankind, they will begin to usurp the liberties of the people. It's not until the Federalists actually agree to this, to amend, to propose in the first Congress the amendments that will become the Bill of Rights, that ratification is even conceivable. Now, again, some states have already ratified. I get that. By the time New York gets around to it. But we've talked about this before. This idea of 9 out of 13 and we have a functioning government is great on paper, but it doesn't work in reality. As Franklin had Ben Franklin had drawn in his cartoon, Unite or Die. It's all of us or none of us. And if New York or Virginia try to go their own way, well, it's going to destroy this. And so when the Federalists in New York agree that they will propose a Bill of Rights, that is at the point where the ratification finally begins to, to become reasonable and achievable. Which brings us to this little thought today that I want to leave you with. The reason that we have a Bill of Rights in our Constitution of the United States, I have one hanging on my wall up there, copy of it. The reason we have that, and as precious as it is to you and I, is because the anti-federalists, the people who oppose the ratification of the Constitution, insisted on it and worked on it and talked about it, and pushed for. You understand that? It was the people who were not in favor of the proposed Constitution that demanded and won the concession of 10 amendments that we call the Bill of Rights. Weird to think about that, isn't it? I mean, if you love the Bill of Rights, I certainly do. You're actually more anti-federalist than federalist. And in today's environment, doesn't that seem to ring more true than ever?